This is Black Market Leadership, the underground resource for disruptors and status quo breakers. Did you or were you able to get uh, civilian lawyers or, or was that an option? Or was that something you wanted or are we happy with, with what you got? Yeah, as so a defense. that's a great question. Uh, something we really wrestled with early on, because if you do get a civilian attorney, what you're basically telling the, the command is that like, I don't trust the trial defense that's being provided. And I'm I'm basically like, I'm going DEFCON 4. Like I'm, I'm fixing to come after you guys because civilian attorneys have access and have the authority to go to the media. If you're using trial defense um, from the unit that provides it, they're just, they're not, they've got a very short leash. The other thing too, that I, I didn't really think of prior to this point in time, because it was just not something I'd been introduced to or come up, come up against, but you have a trial defense and you have a prosecution that all work for the same command. And I feel like that's a conflict of interest. Absolutely. They all wear the same patch. They all report to the same dude at the end of the day. And so once I started to think through this, I was like, hell no, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to have a, you know, a defense attorney who works for the guy that's trying to, you know, prosecute me. So I need to have someone to check and balance the system. So yeah, we, we did, we hired a civilian attorney. His name was Neil Puckett. Um, fantastic lawyer, did a great job for us. Uh, the military attorney I had was Heather Mastin, who has since passed, but she was um, just wonderful, a, a great champion to myself and to the guys. Um, stood with us through that and then just, you know, was wonderful to just support us for the years after as well. Did your attorney, Mr. Puckett, did, uh, or I should say Mr. Puckett Esquire, <laughs> uh, right. did, did he have issues more. getting uh, secret intel to support you or did, did, did the Army try to hide that from him? Yes, they they were they made his coming to Afghanistan and having access to the information he needed, though he had the appropriate clearances, they made it difficult. They slow rolled it. The biggest thing that happened that we didn't realize until after the fact, and so far after the fact that it didn't make it into the book. But we 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 learned, and I have absolute proof of this. So if we ever go to film, you know, this this, which is something that we're working on right now, this will make it into the film um, that didn't make it into the book. The, the brigade JAG and the division um, JAG conspired together to make the findings from the article 32 an incomplete record. So there's a kind of a loophole that shouldn't be there, but if if the person who's doing the investigation, which is the investigating officer who serves as the judge and jury for the Article 32, does not actually physically deliver to the convening authority, in this case, the brigade commander, the results or his findings, then it's rendered a com incomplete record and it's never filed. And so they, after having read the find an electronic version of the findings, they reached out to me and offered to plea. Now that's an unfair advantage because I don't have access to the findings. So basically we're, we have this weak period after the article 32 is complete and they have access to the electronic version of this 90 page set of findings, which I have since read after the fact, but at that time had no idea any of this stuff was going on, right? Cause I'm not a lawyer. Um, they read it and they go, holy shit, we look like ass in this set of findings. And it looks like we hung this young commander and his, com his company out to dry. Let's just offer a plea. I took the plea because in that political climate where, you know, people were being prosecuted for, you know, just like you mentioned, Clint Lawrence, there's, you know, half a dozen other cases at that time. They used to be known as the Leavenworth 12 at the time. People were being thrown under the bus by commands for mm -hmm. very minor infractions. And so I would have not been... Um, seen by, or my case would not have been adjudicated by a jury of my peers. Uh, it, it would have been more senior um, officers who had not really seen the same, same level of combat and could not provide the same perspective that I needed for a fair and balanced trial. Plus all those guys report to the same command. It's still a conflict of interest. So it's like a thing inside a thing that if you're not really thinking about and abstract yourself outside of it, you don't realize that all these COIs exist. And it's really just, it's made to fulfill its own destiny, right? As set by the command itself. And there's a lot of pressure for people to just fall in line. 
So when that plea was offered, I just took it and I got out of the military. It was a clean break. I got out with a general um, under honorable conditions. But at that time, um, I didn't know that the brigade commander had access to the findings and that the findings painted the command in a very negative light for not having provided proper support to us. So um, they simply refused to receive the findings. It was rendered incomplete. And what was disclosed to me by a member of the, um, the legal team on the prosecution side after the fact, uh, because uh, this person uh, had a guilty conscience <laughs> some number of years later about how this all rolled out or happened or uh, unfolded. Uh, but that person told me, um, now a senior officer in the army and he's done really well. And, you know, by all accounts, a stand-up guy, just a young officer at the time caught in a bad situation with a lot of undue command influence. But that person told me that the reason why the command chose to not receive the record so that it would be rendered complete is so that it would never be accessible through the Freedom of Information Act. Block FOIA. Wow. Yep. Wow. So oh. that's, that's kind of the, to me, if you look at this story, which is a true story, which is hard for me to believe at times, you know, it's like Band of Brothers, and then it's like a few good men with a legal drama. There's some espionage involved with the counter intel stuff, right? But this legal stuff to me is like the blockbuster part of all this, just the, the conspiracy and, you know, just how they were working to really hide this set of findings from public view so that the American people would not know. Just like the American public didn't know that we had you know, Taliban that were uh, kidnapping U.S. service members' bodies and mutilating them. That never made the yeah. 6 p.m. news, right? That stuff was all sequestered and held. The insider threat that existed for, you know, decades in the global war on terror was categorized according to military released reporting as workplace violence. So that way the American public would never know that we actually had a lot of, um, you know, Afghan police and army that were turning on the U.S. that were trying to partner with them and killing them. Green yeah. on blue. So they call that green, green on blue. Green on blue in that partnership. Like all that stuff was hidden for years by all these senior GOs and, you know, all, all the appointed officials that were under those respective administrations. So I, I'm assuming that the, uh, was it the brigade commander that screwed you over? Is probably a two-star general now. He did make it to two stars. No shit. Did he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not surprised. I, it's, yep. it's it's disgusting. It really is disgusting. Uh, you know, I was just thinking uh, all the initiative, you, you, what you did is what is what supposedly the army says, hey, we expect of our leaders to take the initiative to do the right thing without without uh, uh, prodding. And, yeah. and you get punished for that. Oh, my God. So you got a did you say a general but under honor or how do you say a discharge? Yeah, that's right. So there's four different types, everything from honorable to other than honorable. I'm sorry. Yeah, to honorable, general, other than honorable, dishonorable. So I got general, which is the second best out of the two. I, I feel like I deserve an honorable. We've been fighting to try to make that happen, but it's really not easy. And not a lot of politicians have um, the backbone to fight for that sort of thing. And I wouldn't want it upgraded under this administration anyway. So. Well, uh well, I mean, you, I mean, you, uh, you're a, your home is original home is Lexington, Kentucky. That's the home of uh, Senator Rand Paul. I bet you uh, have you been able to reach out to him? Maybe I've spoken to his chief of staff in the past. They're great people. This is hard for me because, like, I'm one person, and like right now, our country is just spiraling. Yeah, like you and I know that we're awake and understand like exactly the threat that we're under and. Maybe we just have a taste of what's really going on. I'm afraid it's way worse than I really understand. It's hard for me to go advocate for myself when I'm capable of earning a living and able to provide for my family when there are so many other battles that we need champions like Rand Paul to fight. So it's on his radar. I'd love to re-engage with him, but you will never hear me say that dude's screwing me over because he's not paying attention to this. Sure. Because that guy is in a fight for our country's future you know, unlike any other time in history. And I'm a low priority, relatively speaking. But one day when we, we can get to a better place, I'd love to revisit the issue. You know, uh, you mentioned the term bread pill before. And I, again, for the years, 
reading your book, I, I, I mean, I get really mad. Listen to you talk about, it, I get mad because I, I didn't realize how bad it was. I'd heard stories. I'm like, okay, that's like an anomaly. But I would tell you, in my, in my case, the red pill for me was the Russian uh, Ukrainian war. I had never in my life seen so much propaganda. So many people our age who, who you know went to VMI and West Point who are yeah. saying the dumbest shit. It's Just total repeating. lies. It's total Just lies. Yeah. 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 And I'm just like, it's that corrupt. I mean, it, it is a cesspool. I just never realized how bad it was. Oh, yeah. we have we have no business being over there. Totally. Oh yeah, totally. And and, and oh. yeah, I mean that's a whole different argument. Hey, you mentioned before about. Um, I, I do want to ask you because when I talked to Scott Horton, uh, we were taught. I didn't know this. The Taliban, uh, when Bin Laden and and uh, Al Qaeda attacked us. Uh, the Taliban wanted to get Bin Laden the hell out of the country. They were no, there were no fans of him. I didn't know that, but you, you mentioned earlier to ask you about um, about your knowledge of, uh, you know, us going into Afghanistan. Why, why did you say that we had no purpose or no reason to go in there? Yeah, I, so we occupied all of Afghanistan, and we we basically. Um, I mean, to me, it feels like we punished them for 20 years. The people of Afghanistan, right? Yeah. We we tried to change the way they live, the way they think. Um, how arrogant of us <laughs> as a people to go in and think that we could and believe that we should do something like that, especially when it wasn't asked for. And the people that, if you believe, are the people that attacked us on 9-11 weren't Afghans per se, Right. Not in the sense that, you know, is advertised right in the mainstream or by our government. They were they were extremists that were on the border from a very specific region. Why didn't we just go lock that area down? Oh, like, totally. Uh, why, why did we have to take over an entire country? And to me, you know, the answer is, you know, in, in the question, like it's because there was an ulterior motive. And that's a whole other oh. red pill, all of yarn. So. That's oh, no. I, I think you and I are going to be having a lot of good conversations because I know <laughs> where you're going on this. Um, okay. Okay. So if I'm correct, you have a degree in engineering. Is that right? I do. Um, but BS, um, not, not that way, though. Bachelor's of Science BS from West Point in engineering and then uh, an MBA from Georgia Tech Management and Technology. So what are you doing now then? I'm looking. Um, Typically, I've been in defense technology or in a security technology operations role, either in pre-sales, helping the sales team um, put on the best face they can for closing a sale from a technology perspective. Uh, and then I've done a lot of work on deploying or implementing technology. So uh, I am looking, uh, but really, um, as I'm working through um, this post-severance uh, period, so I got severed out of a company that had restructured post acquisition and the entire leadership uh, team was basically restructured out. And it just, it happens, right? It's, it's happened to the best of us, uh, but I've um, been working with, or just kind of throwing my time towards a ministry that I'm very passionate about, uh, not-for-profit called Warriors Set Free. And we basically um, work with the veterans of the law enforcement and military community to heal from the trauma of their past we help them win life's battles and we help them develop a faith walk um, that will stay, you know, with them um, throughout their future. And uh, what I've seen in this space, just having experienced like a lot of veterans, the, a lot of the programming that's out there. I read a story once uh, or a report once that said there were around 40,000 different not-for-profits or charities in the U S alone focused on veterans. And so there's constantly this churn of, not-for-profits being started up, not-for-profits folding, some have stuck, some haven't. All while that's going on, um, and I don't know if you read this study that came out in September, but the University of Alabama partnered with the federal government to better understand suicide statistics as it relates to our veterans. The number 22 has been touted for a number of years now as kind of the, the number of suicides per day by our veteran community. This University of Alabama study believes that the number is actually closer to 44. Oh, my God. Really? So, yeah. So no longer hashtag 22 a day, hashtag 44 a day. 
And what they've done is basically gone in and really studied how the reporting is done for some of these, especially larger states. And I'll send you a link to that because we got to drop this in the podcast for people to access it. It's a, it's a three page summary with some data that's pretty powerful, but they believe that 44 veterans are killing themselves a day. So if there are a couple of hundred people kill themselves every day in the US in general, and 44 of those are veterans, something's like really effed up, right? Yeah, 16,000 so a year, wow. Yeah, so so this um, this group that I'm working with, Warriors Set Free, we believe that the problem is a heart issue. And we believe that we have to go in and address the heart and soul of the veteran of law enforcement or the military in order to reset them and get them back into life where they have a chance, you know, at a successful future. A lot of what we see in the not-for-profit space is just let's go fishing, let's go on a hunting trip, let's let's do an activity for a weekend or a week, but nothing is ever really fixed or changed for that veteran. And so I believe there's been a lot of damage done to the soul. And uh, I think it's for a lot of reasons that people take for granted or just don't understand. And I'll just give you a couple of examples, but. The way we pulled out of Afghanistan, right, last year. Yeah. I mean, Catastrophe. all of us, dude, you talk about just um, just being like feeling defeated, right? Anyone who's worn a uniform in the last 20 years is just going, what the heck just happened? What did, what did we spend? What did we give? I mean, you think about the, the divorce rate being about 80% for any veteran who's been deployed once or more. Wow. What, did we give our, what did we give our marriages to? What did we give these years of deployments to and trainups to? What did we give our bodies to? What did we sacrifice for in order to leave and just pull the plug in that fashion? Just those sorts of things about one, us not being in the roar for the right reasons, not having the moral high ground, which I know, especially in retrospect, is a check on everyone's heart, um, looking back on it. And then how... Um, we were in such a dishonorable way pulled out of that conflict is also just a huge slap in the face. These things are woundings that all veterans, you know, their soul takes on. And so, you know, that on top of the combat, just on top of the separation and all the other factors that come into play um, and the trickle down, right? Because the being deployed over and over again, you know, being deployed in a combat zone or not, you're still experiencing separation. Your family, you know, um, it, it, it can tend to crumble because of the dynamics at play that the military puts you in. And then once you realize that you, you did all that for not, that it didn't really matter anyways, I think that's where a lot of people, you know, if they're already in difficult spots. So we really focus on going in and unpackaging that and trying to heal the soul. So our team does what we call a freedom appointment. It's a one day, it's really half a day, but we, we like to block off a half day, uh, I'm sorry, a full day with the veteran of the military law enforcement. And we do what's called a freedom appointment and we do a, a scrubbing of their soul. You know, we, we get in there, we unpackage a lot of things and we help put them back together uh, so that they're truly ready to take on life and we do that at no cost to the veteran. Oh, so, wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so something I'm really excited about because I've gone through it myself. It's um, paid tremendous dividends for me and my family and just the outlook I have on life and um, just, you know, th the weight that I carry or no longer carry, if you want to look at it that way. I just I feel a lot lighter and I'm um, just much more engaged in life. And I want to make sure that other veterans experience that. The other thing I'd like to say on that too is that um, I, I want to be very careful uh, to also honor and just call out our brothers and sisters in law enforcement. They have been beaten down um, and just dishonored by this country and a lot of the cities and governments throughout this country in a way that um, truly has brought me to tears many times in the past couple of years. And so um, we offer the same you know, it's called Warrior Set Free for a reason. It's it's extended to all warriors. So to our brothers and sisters in arms in blue uh, in the front line, the uh, first responder community, this is also available to you at no cost. So if you all know anyone, please reach out to us, reach out to me. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to get them going. 
Oh, I love that. My uh, my grandfather died in 98 and we realized, I think six months before he died, he had PTSD. He was a paratrooper in World War II and captured at the Battle of the Bulge. And he had, he suffered with PTSD for 50 years and it, and it came out uh, spousal abuse, really bad, just really, uh, it was horrible. It really was. And no one ever helped him. He didn't know how to get it. So what you're doing, I think is just fantastic. Congratulations. And boy, uh, I bet it's such a great service. I have one more question for you. And this is a selfish question because I'm writing my book now and I okay. see that you have a co-author, Lynn Vincent. So first of all, what's it like to work with a co-author and what's it like to write a book? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I was very lucky and I had a very non-standard experience in that I had a world-renowned writer, author, journalist. I mean, Lynn's got several books that you know have sold um, tens of millions of copies each. Wow, she's got a couple what an of opportunity. Books. Wow. Yeah, she's had a couple of books uh, be made into movies. She's just, um, she's fantastic. She approached me. So it wasn't like I had to go from scratch and start this process. In fact, when she approached me, I turned her down the first couple of times just because it was such a difficult and traumatic experience. First and couple of times? Couple? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, okay. We, we, How did she hear about you? I got to interrupt you. How did she hear about you? I think somebody um, pushed the story to her. She was writing for a magazine at the time, and then she did a feature on what had happened in Afghanistan at that time in 2008 and nine. So um, when that feature was published and I was able to read and see that she was, you know, not just a little legitimate journalist, but that she looked at things in a very logical way, was very fair and balanced. Um, I was like, okay, this is worth a conversation. So we took it from there. And so I, I, I got to ask, I got to ask how the, uh, how the, the sausage is made in the back. You write your pieces, you give it to her, you go back and forth. Does she give you an outline? You give her an outline. How did, does she edit? How does it, how does this thing unfold? Yeah, no, great question. Um, you know, I, I brought a little of my organizational skills to the table and I feel like it really helped both of us come up with a better, uh, cleaner product. Dog Company is an interesting story because we really wanted to communicate things on a couple of different themes, um, three to be specific. And so, you know, we, we really wanted to talk about what was going on in the moment with the unit. And so you've got that thread that's constantly running through the book. Then we had this legal drama that's weaving in and out as well. And then there's just we wanted the reader to really understand without having to say it, but just by deduction. So we had to just be careful to describe the situation. Part of that is from a liability and risk management perspective. When you start calling out people and organizations directly, you put yourself at risk. Oh yeah. If you tell a story in the right way and you leave people, you know, who are smart enough to figure out for themselves to their own conclusions, you still achieve the same effect. So that was the third arm. And that arm you know, that was being woven in and out was basically, what is going on with our government? What, what are these rules of engagement? Why are we in Afghanistan? How is this war being prosecuted in such an incompetent manner? Like that theme was the other theme. And so that's, that's pretty complicated. Like you're not just telling one story, but you're kind of telling three stories at once because we had so many things we wanted to accomplish with the story. And I feel like we did a good job. And if you go into Amazon or Audible, I think we're at about 12 or 1300 reviews and 80% of them are five-star reviews. I mean, we're at like 4.8 stars. So consistently highly reviewed story by very, um, you know, in the military community is very critical. The people that read these sorts of books, like they, they're not afraid to tell you what they think. <laughs> so, um, A lot of four letter words involved. Yeah, right. <laughs> yep. But the, what we did is we built a, a matrix and we basically listed out, um, you know, it's kind of like if you're building a line of operation campaign plan, right? So we had three lines of operation and each of those represent an arc or a theme that we want to capitalize in the story. And then all of the intermediate steps that get you to your end state are milestones or um, landmarks that you want to elicit um, and, or uh, you want your reader to come to a conclusion order. So we listed all those out in a table format. 
And then from there, we basically built a story that would be tagged to each one of those, um, those, those items. Oh, that's so smart. Oh, I got it. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yep. So there's continuity. You can have three, you can have three different stories. Oh, there's continuity in terms of time, but you're emphasizing three different themes or, uh, uh, did you have to reach out to the brigade commanders and say, Hey, I'm writing this book. Guess what? People are probably know you're, who I'm talking about. We requested him for interview. We requested the battalion commander for interview. We requested, I think we requested General Milley for an interview. He was um, the deputy commanding general for the division at the time. So, you know, I know he's moved on and done bigger and better things. Um, well, I wouldn't say better. He's done bigger yeah, things. Thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> I, he's he's done bigger things. He really was truly the one responsible for spreading all of us out in Afghanistan to the point that we were set up for, I mean, we were just waiting for um, tragedy. We were just waiting for something to fall Yeah, apart. I mean, you're on the defense. You're just waiting. In fact, uh, yeah. um, uh, years ago, I bought, in fact, someone gave it to me a present. It was a Soviet, it was a Soviet high command's after action review of the Soviet war. And it came okay. out, I think in 2012. And the reason okay. is because back, uh, yes, yes, people, that you know, the Soviet Union fell was in 91. It took that long because back in Soviet philosophy, uh, a, a uh, counterinsurgency doesn't exist. So the war didn't exist. But reading, reading, <laughs> reading their eight years of uh, uh, in Afghanistan, it's literally nothing but guarding damn uh, supply routes. That's all it is. They, yeah, a little tax here and there, but. And, and in fact, uh, just to let you know, when I was talking, uh, when I interviewed Michael Shoyer about this, uh, when uh, 9-11 happened, he went out and he said he went out to the library and got a bunch of books about the British expedition. And he would have to go brief a lot of these 06s, these generals and, and you know, high colonels or excuse me, uh, high colonels and uh, some of these general officers. They had no knowledge, no knowledge of what the British did, of the, the, the environment, the culture of Afghanistan. They just threw them in get a footprint there and just absorb what comes. So, uh, yeah. yeah. We, we essentially fixed ourselves. I mean, this is a doctrinal term, but we fixed ourselves in Afghanistan. So, you know, I, I, when I go out and talk, I it depend on the audience. I talk about this um, in pretty, pretty good detail. We had force ratios, doctrinal force ratios that, we had created for our military. These were in our technical manuals, our, our FMs, to, to describe the number of boots you need on the ground per population you're trying to secure. And for the number of people that were in Iraq, I mean, it's like you know tens of millions of people. In order to be successful in a counterinsurgency in Iraq, uh, Shinseki communicated when he was in. You know, um, I think it was, was it Secretary of the Army at the time. I think so. Or? Was it was a half a million, five hundred thousand? That he, that he that's right. That's right. So these numbers you've you've heard, but a lot of people don't realize. Like there was a doctrinal um, template for mm -hmm. what we needed to be successful, and um, Rumsfeld and Paul Wolfowitz, who were all under the Secretary of Defense's office, said, uh, "I think we can make up for it with technology, or we'll come up with a strategy, or never mind, never mind <laughs> doctrine. You know, we're 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 still going to push forward, um, even." More so the case in Afghanistan, which I, I believe had more people, has or had more people at the time, but just less infrastructure, which means it was harder to manage, you know, from a, a military conflict standpoint. So, you know, we we didn't meet the doctrinal standards for Iraq. I think the highest number of people we ever sent to Iraq with the standard was close somewhere between five hundred and six hundred thousand to beat success. I think we had 130k at the most. In and Afghanistan. In Afghanistan no, in Iraq. Oh, Iraq, then, excuse me. Yep. And then in Afghanistan, I don't know that we ever topped a hundred. Right. Oh, and they probably had didn't. roughly the same number, if you know, if not more people. So we we never um met our own criteria for success. Yep. Like we we never set ourselves like it's like we knew we were gonna go in and fail at this thing, and we're just like, well, we're going anyways. And that's that's where I'm like, you know. When I start thinking about this in retrospect, I'm going, okay, what's really going on? Yeah. You know, why did we really go in there? And um, General West talks a little bit about this in his biography. He says that just before we kicked off in Iraq, he, um, and, and I only kept up with him because he graduated me from West Point. That's who I received my diploma from. 
but he he wrote in his biography he said that when he was uh in the pentagon after just having gotten out of the military just before uh we went into iraq he was sitting down with senior um officials in the pentagon like at the highest level we're talking like three and four star or equivalent mm -hmm. on the civilian side deci like decision makers for what our country does militarily and uh he said that there was a um basically a, a discussion that he became a part of where it was disclosed to him that our country since having been in Iraq the first time had a list of several countries that we um, needed to go into and operate for a period of time in order to disrupt China's influence over those countries in the future because they knew that China was going to succeed us as a global power in the world. So basically, like if I said this in really crude terms, we're going to go into those countries, we're going to muddy the water, and we're going to make it harder for the next guy so yep. that we can buy ourselves some time because we know that we're declining as a country. Oh, and so this depressing. is coming from the highest level, right? Like I'm not making this stuff up. This yeah. is a summary of, you know, what I've read from credible people, you know, who've, who've operated at the highest level in the military. So hey, I don't doubt it. You know, they, they, what they said now is conspiracy theories or, or theories are really now just uh, upcoming attractions. Uh, a, lot, yeah. a lot of them come true. Yeah. So Roger Hill, uh, where can people find you? Is that captainrogerhill.com? Is that one it's, of the... Yeah, that that's the website. And, um, you know, I'm on Facebook. I don't um, I don't post a lot these days, but if you reach out to me, I'll respond. Or um, if you go to my website, there's a way to, to contact me, which goes straight to my email and I'll respond. So yeah, if, if you guys are interested, have questions, if you want to pick up a copy of the book, you can get it cheaper on Amazon. So don't buy it from me. But if you want to sign a copy... <laughs> order for me and I'd be happy to send you one. Um, and then if you just wanted to talk, you know, um, especially, you know, if, if you're interested in a freedom appointment um, or just struggling, I'm, I'm like any other brother that's out there, you know, that served in uniform. So please reach out. I'm there for you. Oh, don't, don't let another day or hour go by. If you, you've got somebody that's willing to listen and I believe has um, a, a very good tool at my disposal to help you, you know, at whatever you feel like you're struggling with right now. Oh, I love it. I love it. So there we go. We got Mr. Uh, Roger Hill, author of Dog Company, a true story of American soldiers abandoned by their high command. His website again is captainrogerhill.com. By the way, very nice uh, website. I saw my, my marketing guy uh, for my upcoming book, make it look like his. I, I like his. Thank you. And, and what is the website for the, uh, one more thing. What is the website for the uh, nonprofit? Yeah, it's warriorssetfree.org. Warriors, plural, the word set, and then the word free, all one word, dot org. Perfect. 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 So yeah. if you need some uh, support and you're a veteran or your police, uh, you need some support, reach out to warriorssetfree.org. All right, Mr. Roger Hill, West Point, class of 2000. Thank you so much for uh, this interview. I got to tell you, man, you're a testament to West Point. You really are. So thank you for your service and thank you for everything you've done. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate all that you're doing. Thank God you. bless. If you like this content and want to hear other things like it, head on over to the website at blackmarketleadership.com. That's blackmarketleadership.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast and you can even create a free member's profile.